All right, we're going to look at, uh, last class we looked at William Wordsworth and the uh, preface to lyrical ballads that he appended to the, uh, that poetic endeavor that both he and Coleridge wrote and um, brought it out again in 1802, uh, a second edition. And um, he did so at the behest of Coleridge, uh, he says, he, he mentions a friend, but the friend is Coleridge, which becomes clear in Coleridge's own writing. And between that period, so the second edition and this work that we're looking at today by Coleridge himself, 15 years have passed. And what we find uh, from, it's to some degree mentioned in the biography itself, but we'll find it in other um, writings of Coleridge as well. He took issue with Wordsworth's theory uh, privately and asked him to amend it in certain ways and to stop, among other things, using the word imagination, uh, which Coleridge regarded as not quite his own personal property, but thought that he understood it in a certain way and wanted to write on it. And Wordsworth kept insisting in writing on it. And he did, in fact, uh, write on it. And in 1815, brought out an edition of his poems to which he appended the preface once again uh, to lyrical ballads and, um, and also wrote on what the imagination was. And so Coleridge was uh, irked, to put it mildly, and felt the need to defend uh, his own position because he uh, was aware, one, of the popularity of the poetry because they both got a lot of uh, acclaim for that, but also of the controversy that was attached to it because there were allegations of, um, of heresy uh, being made. And Coleridge, between the time in which they wrote the ballads together, and uh, this time had made a, I would say, a move from his Unitarian upbringing, so his father was a Unitarian minister, uh, towards Trinitarian Orthodox Christianity. And whether he um, saw himself as a heretic back when he wrote his own poetry, um, or whether there's some way that he could see his old work and still affirm it uh, as a Trinitarian believer later on is unclear to me. But what is clear is that the explanation for it, he thought, was problematic um, theologically and even, even in terms of, uh, even aside from the theological objections, just simply in its, its sweeping generalizations, Coleridge thought that this was, the theory was untenable. And so he endeavored in this work, and it's the Biographia Literaria, or sketches of his literary life, uh, to try and write uh, two things. One, he did want to give an account of how he came uh, to hold the metaphysical views that he held, which is a funny old thing. He connected this with his literary life. Now, it says literary life. It's not just his personal life. So if you read the Biographia from the beginning to the end, which I did uh, a few times, uh, the, my uh, master's thesis was on the second half of the Biographia. Um, but if you read it, you find that there's not a great deal in terms of autobiographical information. There, I mean, there's some, but more it's, his, it's a literary life. It's a literary autobiography. It's how he develops as a, as a writer. Those are the incidents that he includes in this uh, work. And he also wants to some, de to some degree give a, an equivalent in prose to Wordsworth's work in uh, poetry. Wordsworth had written The Prelude by this time. It published it in 1805. So The Prelude had come out, 1805, which in Wordsworth's mind was but a prelude to the epic that he would later write and never did write, by the way. So he wrote a prelude to the epic that was supposed to be, you know, just the working up to write the epic, which he then never wrote. So then this became the epic, more or less. And it's considered so and has epic features. Um, but Wordsworth's biographia is the, uh, prose, the prose equivalent to the prelude. 
And some have argued that uh, Coleridge, um, by being involved in the literary uh, critical endeavor, killed his um, capacities as a poet. So he never wrote poetry to the degree or to the success that he did early on later in life. So he became a, a famous as a critic. And he is the best critic of his day, without a doubt. And one of the great uh, critical minds in the uh, literary establishment, at least in English letters, for sure. Um, and he does not write much poetry later on in life. And why that is, is not entirely clear. Is it because of his uh, conviction that Wordsworth was the greater poet and just felt uh, small by consequence? Is it because of his, um, his addictions to laudanum, a painkiller, uh, which he, it was a commonly prescribed um, uh, opioid, which uh, he had, he had pains, they were prescribed him and he became addicted and he couldn't kick it. His whole life he was ashamed of it, he was just, he found it abominable and it, it left him in a, sort of a pitiable state at, at times and often dependent on others. So he loathed himself as well. This interesting aspect of uh, famous figures is that uh, their private lives are often marked by uh, woe and misery and self-loathing and so forth. But that, that was the case with him. So he's a bit of a figure of fun for some. On the other hand, he's also a, a formidable lecturer, and he would, when it, what he would lecture in public, the halls would pack. And he would talk and talk and talk, and he wouldn't stop talking. And people writing it down, he would write it down. Uh, as well, he wrote voluminously in his criticism, and, um, and the other members of the literary establishment would flock to go see him. So people were really... Uh, in awe of him as a critic. And so when he writes this, it is about himself. There's no doubt about it. It's called the Biographia Literaria. But the, in the second half, although the, actually the whole of the poem is engaging with Wordsworth. It's a funny old thing. And it's partly because his, his, his literary endeavors begin with Wordsworth. I mean, he wrote poems before he met Wordsworth. Some of them not, not too bad at that. But he becomes famous because of the lyrical ballads. Now remember, those include uh, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner and so forth. Um, uh, some of his best poems written early on. Uh, so when he's reflecting on his own literary life, he also is reflecting simultaneously on Wordsworth's literary merits. And that's where it gets sort of uncomfortable because in, I'll make a general statement and we'll get the specifics, he argues that Wordsworth is a great poet and the greatest of his day. And that furthermore, there are certain features of Wordsworth's poetry that surpass those of past writers. And he's going to, argue, he's going to talk very specifically about what those features are. Now, Coleridge being the great critic of his day and, and regarded as such, so he writes... Um, lectures on Shakespeare, which I would say are readable to this very day, very interesting. And, he, and the Romantics, and chiefly Coleridge, are, are responsible for making Col uh, Shakespeare as famous as he is. So Dr. Johnson, yes, for sure, but, the, but Coleridge's lectures really raise Shakespeare's banner high. Um, but people will value his opinion as a literary critic at this point. So when he says that Wordsworth is the great poet of his day and, and in some ways is the greatest poet, people accept it and say this is okay. And so Wordsworth has become so famous, maybe and partly in consequence to this, of this, that he becomes the poet laureate. So he goes from an anti-establishment figure to the, the establishment figure. Slightly ironic. So he's in sympathy with the French Revolution, in many ways uh, a critic of the crown and its activities, to being, as I say, poet laureate. Um, so there's that side of it. On the other hand, his criticisms of Wordsworth's uh, defense is devastating and humiliating, and uh, I think. And it's so bad that they men stop talking. So there, it's a, it's a, on a, I guess on a personal front, it's 
it's interesting for those of you who are interested in that aspect of things. But it's one of the great literary friendships that then became so uh, fraught with conflict and personal uh, animosity that they were no longer in speaking terms. And in part because Wordsworth was disgusted with Coleridge. Not just for the criticism, but it, he, the, the, the addictions and so forth, he found him embarrassing. But it, it's hard to say, that, but there's, there's, there are issues between the two men. Um, but the Biographia, now we, we only have certain extracts in the, the volume from Norton, and I'm going to go beyond those because Norton's are not sufficient for what I want to uh, talk about today. Uh, but I'm going to start with chapter four from the first half of the Biographia. Oh, by the way. So it came out in two parts. Uh, part one uh, is chapters one to 13. And then part two came out uh, later on. And it really is a work of two parts. And uh, part one is really uh, the development of the poetic mind. And it concludes with the, the great statement on the imagination which is quoted everywhere by everyone when talking about the romantic imagination. So chapter 13, Wordsworth gives his great definition or definitions, because there's more than one. And usually that is taken by the literary establishment to be, this is the definition of the imagination for the romantic. So it's taken as that of romanticism as a whole. Uh, and including for Wordsworth, for Shelley, for Keats, for Byron, for Blake to some degree, for the whole Romantic movement. I have argued that this is not so, um, that he uh, to some degree is setting a boundary marker between what he regards as a defensible position and what his contemporary Wordsworth is calling the Romantic position. And Coleridge is more in keeping with the traditional view. So he will fit with, this is what I'm going to argue, I'm going to, I'm going to support it based on a reading of Coleridge. He's going to argue that uh, Wordsworth's view of the imagination is first of all his own and, and it is unique, but two, that it's untenable. And, and thirdly, that a proper view of the imagination has to have a continuity before it. It can't be wholly original. And it can't, be, uh, it can't be unearthed by going back to origins, back to nature, by being original, by being with the common people, by reflecting on common language, by uh, being close to the earth. That's not what the imagination is, says Coleridge, and it never was. And if it's true that it reflects Wordsworth's view, and Coleridge thinks that it does to some degree, although not wholly, he thinks that he contradicts himself and that actually it's not even true of his own view. Um, it might make something unique and valuable about Wordsworth's poetry, but it says nothing about poetry in general. So it does not apply historically. It's, a, it's a, an invalid and ahistorical perspective. So all of those things. Now all of these diminish then Wordsworth's greatness as an artist because he's sort of he represents his age but he doesn't seem to represent the realm of poetry in general at least that's how it seems to me but I'll, I'll come to that in a minute but so in chapter four he says uh, commenting on uh, uh, his uh, their time together so in my last year of residence at Cambridge he says and both of them Coleridge went to Cambridge Wordsworth went to Cambridge Coleridge is uh, few years older than him, maybe even five years older. Um, he says, I became acquainted with Mr. Wordsworth's first publication entitled Descriptive Sketches and seldom, if ever, was the emergence of an original poetic genius above the literary horizon more evidently announced. In the form, style, and manner of the whole poem and in the structure of the particular lines and the periods, there is, an, there is an harshness and acerbity connected and combined with words and images all aglow which may, might recall those products of the vegetable world, where gorgeous blossoms rise out of the hard and thorny rind and shell within which the rich fruit was elaborating. The language was not only peculiar and strong, but at times naughty and contorted as by its own impatient strength. 
While the novelty and struggling crowd of images acting in conjunction with the difficulties of the style demanded always a greater closeness of attention than poetry, at all events, than descriptive poetry, has a right to claim. So he, there's a great mind here, writing poetry that is so powerful that it's, it's just pushing out from the hardness of the lines. There's a mind underneath it, and that's what he is. There's a spirit and the poetic psyche, so there's a poetic a great mind here that is uh, almost uh, chomping at the bit, trying to get out of the, the stable. And he talks about this in the lyrical ballads. Now here's how it moves on in the lyrical ballads. Compare that description of the descriptive sketches with the lyrical ballads, and he says of them, there, there was here no mark of strained thought or forced diction, no crowd or turbulence of imagery. And as the poet hath himself well described in his lines on revisiting the why, in other words, Tintern Abbey, manly reflection and human associations had given both variety and an additional interest to natural ob objects, which in the passion and the appetite of the first love they had seemed to him neither to need or permit. So he has made huge progress. Now he, he, that, that poetic promise is fulfilled in the lyrical ballads. That's just to and he regards him as a genius. And the genius, he goes on to say, gives the impressions of novelty. He says that it gives the impressions of novelty, but it doesn't produce true novelty, because to do true novelty would, would depart from words, or rather Coleridge's view of the truth, which is that there is nothing new, truly new. But it gives the impression of novelty, and that's what a genius does. It makes us think, that's never been said before. That is so powerful, and so this is a unique thing. And yet it's in conjunction with a long history of others saying unique things that happen to fit together. But it gives the, a genius is capable of doing this. And he goes on to say that Milton had a highly imaginative, and Cowley a very fanciful mind. So he, he's setting up terms that he's going to use in Biographia 13 these terms of imaginative and fanciful. And Wordsworth is the poet of the imagination. Whereas Cowley, he suggests, is fancy. Now, these are, this is a contrast. They're both poets. They're both capable men. But one uh, seems to be uh, simply to imitate without anything, a sense of newness or power there. The other seems to present new things and is imaginative, uh, at, but it's just the, the impression of novelty. It's not true novelty. And Wordsworth means no, nothing pejorative by that way, or Coleridge, nothing pejorative by that. Because what's true has always been true, and beautiful and good, it's always been so. So he's not wholly inventing things. And in fact, he says this, isn't the, this is a great quote. He says, in poems, equally as in philosophic disquisition, genius produces the strongest impressions of novelty, while it rescues the most admitted truths from the impotence caused by the very circumstance of their universal admission. Truths of all others the most awful and mysterious, yet being at the same time of universal interest, are too often considered as so true that they lose all the life and efficiency of truth and lie bedridden in the dormitory of the soul, soul side by side with the most despised and exploded errors. Isn't that a great quote? So when things are so demonstrably true and have been received as truth and accepted as true, we use the terminology of it and yet nobody seeks to defend or represent the view anymore. And so it sits there, and we call it orthodoxy, and it becomes stale, and eventually the orthodoxy no longer represents the position. It, re it represents the statement of faith, as it were, but it's not actually the convictions of, that, of those that hold to the statement of faith, just to use an illustration, that sort of thing. So there are truths that are the most true, and they're, they're so true at, at one point, nobody could stand against them anymore. So it was just, we give up, this is the way it is. The, the victory has been won. But the point is that the battle doesn't stop and the creeping untruths start to overcome it. And he talks about the truth now being effectively losing its, 
uh, efficiency in lying dormant, almost bedridden. Can't get out of bed, it's sick. And yet the genius is able to bring a freshness to it and a, and a power and a vitality, that's the point. I think it's a great quote. And Wordsworth, he says, is able to do that. But what he is, he is enunciating then is a potency which was always true. And he says, this excellence, which in all Mr. Wordsworth's writings is more or less predominant and which constitutes the character of his mind, I no sooner felt than I sought to understand. And then he talks about, again, and now he gets the, his, in, in uh, chapter four, his first disquisition between the imagination on the one hand and the fancy. So early on, when he met Wordsworth, he thought, what is it about this man? that seems to articulate the truth in, in such a way that everyone else affirms the truth as well. But this one, he seems, it's really, he's legitimate and the others are fraudulent in some way. What is it? It's this capacity of imagination. And then he talks about their di divergent, um, so he's giving a little bit of a history of their um, he says, uh, Kohler says, metaphysics and psychology have long been my hobby horse. That's his, his thing. He's most interested in this. But to have a hobby horse and to be vain of it are so commonly found together that they pass almost for the same. And he says then, when it comes to writing the lyrical ballads, the explanation which Mr. Wordsworth has himself given will be found to differ from mine. Chiefly, perhaps, as our objects are different. It could scarcely indeed happen otherwise from the advantage I have enjoyed of frequent conversation with him on a subject to which a poem of his own first directed my attention and my conclusion concerning which he had made more lucid to myself by many happy instances drawn from the operation of natural objects on the mind. But it was Mr. Wordsworth's purpose to consider the influences of fancy and imagination as they are manifested in poetry and from the different effects to conclude their, their diversity in kind. While it was my object to investigate the seminal principle. So Wordsworth was thinking the, on the effects, on the audience, whereas Coleridge wanted to dig down to what's the poetic principle involved here. And in that he's acting more like a literary theorist. And Words, Wordsworth was thinking more like a poet and thinking about how he, will it affect the audience, which is true. Poets tend to think this more. How do I have, create this effect on the audience? Whereas Wordsworth or Coleridge rather being a more philosophical mind, what's the principle involved here by which this is even possible? So he's, he's explaining how they're both talking about similar things and yet they seem to be in a, a, a sharp disagreement. And in some ways we'll find out they are. But this is the point. It's my object to investigate the seminal principle, writes Coleridge, and then from the kind to deduce the degree. My friend has drawn a masterly sketch of the branches with their poetic fruitage. I wish to add the trunk and even the roots as far as they lift themselves above ground and are visible to the naked eye of our common consciousness. So Wordsworth is in the realm of literary theory. Literary criticism is not a very good one, I, I would say. Although he's the chief spokesman for the Romantic movement and the preface is regarded as a Romantic manifesto by the literary establishment. I'm not going out on a limb here. That's how it is seen. So this is the manifesto. If that's the case, then what do we make of the biographia, which by the greatest critic of the Romantic era, which suggests that the, that, <laughs> that the manifesto lacks substance and can't be right, or rather is right in the superficial things, but can't be right in the principles. I think people have not read carefully enough. Anyway, I've argued this in print before and um, it was not very well received, which doesn't bother me too much. It does a bit, but not, not too much. Um, it's, it just seems manifest from Coleridge's own writing that here's what Coleridge intends and, and his uh, principles for it. I'm going to skip over some of the other things. If, if we go on through 
uh, chapters 5 all the way up to 12, we get an account of his philosophical development. So he'll talk about uh, reading Bacon and reading Descartes, eventually reading Kant, whom we just read, and Fichte, and Schlegel, and so forth. So he's, writing the, he's reading the German authors in German at a time when nobody's reading the Germans. Coleridge went to Germany uh, for a few years and came back with a mastery of German and having read uh, many of the authors and having encountered the literary, um, the uh, higher criticism, the German higher criticism of the Bible and brought that back to England. It had not yet made waves there and Coleridge was the sort of spokesman for it. Uh, he was regarded as, this is one of the things people made fun of Coleridge for. You know, he's obscure, he makes no sense. He talks in that German mumble jumbo they're confusing everything, flipping everything around. They make no sense. Uh, Forty years later, everybody's referring to the Germans. But when Coleridge does it, he's an outcast and a, you know, he, uh, his metaphysical lunacy, basically. And nobody knows what he's talking about when he goes on about this. Anyway, chapter 13 then re-articulates what I've just said in the 14 here. So I need a, an eraser. lose the sound. Chapter 13, which you do have in your notes, uh, he then comes, and this is at the end of a, a long statement, and he, he interrupts himself. And if you read the biographia, it really is a difficult work to read and a really odd one, because he, he rambles and he digresses and he quotes things in the original Greek and German and Latin without, sometimes without translation. And then somebody at the end, or in chapter 13, interrupts him and tells him to get on with it and stop, <laughs> more or less, and you know, get to the point, whatever. So then he gets to the point. He, he feels to, he, it necessary to include somebody to interrupt him so that he can get to the point, which he then does. So finally, he gives his own uh, work of definition. And it's right there, chapter 13. I think you have it in your notes. And here's the imagination. Now, I talked about the imagination and the fancy. He's going to have two imaginations, primary, secondary, and then you'll have something called the fancy. Now, remember, the imagination was the capacity of geniuses to suggest novelty. in general, whereas the fancy uh, did no such thing, no novelty, just repeating truths, uh, at least the appearance of truth without any vibrancy to it. But anyway, the imagination then, I consider either as primary or secondary. The primary imagination, I hold to be the living power and the prime agent of all human perception and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. Now, anybody who reads that with any knowledge of scripture will hear the echoes of um, Exodus chapter three, when Moses asks God who he is, you know, they're not gonna believe me. Remember Moses left Egypt, he murdered a man, fled into the wilderness, he's been gone 40 years. And now God appears to him in a burning bush and says, go back and tell the Israelites they're going to they're gonna leave Israel and, and I'm appointing you to do it. And he says, well, I, you know, I, I'm not very good at talking and you know, I think you got the wrong guy. Sort of thing, how about my brother or whatever? And okay, no, you can do it, I'll let you do it. Okay, I'll give you the power to do it. And then he repeats it later and he says, okay, well, you can get Aaron there, he can be the spokesman. But as far as you go, what, who shall I say sent you? And he says, well, tell my that I am who I am. It's like, that's not an answer. <laughs> that is not an answer. That's not a name. Or some theologians translate as I shall be what I shall be, which might be better because it suggests that something is 
going to happen in the future that will reveal his identity. I think that might be more accurate. Uh, theologians have historically connected, though, the I am to being. God is in his nature being. He's the essence of being. Um, and, and peg it back to that straight. So the found is, and that becomes then the basis of Thomistic theology, right? The beingness of God. Um, so that, that echo is there clearly. But he speaks of that rather differently. He says, this is of the imagination. He holds it to be the living power and the prime agent of all human perception. Now, agent is capitalized. Why is it? Is it because it's reference to God? Is it because because perception is also capitalized, right? And imagination is capitalized. And capitalization at this stage isn't quite so standardized. Does he, does he mean it in a platonic sense? Does he mean it to refer to, to God and therefore capitalizing it? It's not clear. In German, all substantives have capitals. So every noun has a capital, not just proper names, every noun. Is it because he's reading too much German and he throws, the, for that I don't know. But both power and agent and perception are capitalized. So it could be referring to God. And he, he talks about it as the power and the agent and perception. Is it a reference to God or is it a reference to a God-like power within human nature? Or is it both? At any rate, it's, it's at the level of perception. So he's not none of this Kantian conformity to our capacity to understand it, but of perception that seems to me uh, the other way around. And furthermore, he calls it a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. So two th there's all sorts of stuff going on here. But it seems to me that he is, in, in this description of the imagination, he is talking about a capacity for understanding the world uh, with what we would call knowledge. in which our thoughts recapitulate God's thoughts. A repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. So when God names things and they come into being, and then when we name the things that he's named, we are acting imaginatively which is, I think, stretches the usual understanding of imagination. Imagination usually is, at least in the English language, connected with artistic creativity, something new, right? No? Somebody's highly imaginative, they do things in a new way you'd never thought of. That, that's his secondary imagination. The primary is to think God's thoughts after him. And it's unclear whether it's from divine agency or agency within, within us that has that features like it. But there's a clear differ difference between the finite mind and the divine mind or the eternal. But that clarity there, so that's the foundation for what comes after because the secondary, he considers an echo of the former, coexisting with the conscious will, yet still as identical with the primary in the kind of its agency and differing only in degree and in the mode of its operation. What is the mode? It dissolves, diffuses, dissipates in order to recreate or where this process is rendered impossible, yet still at all events, it struggles to idealize and to unify. It is essentially vital, even as all objects, as objects are, are essentially fixed and dead. Okay, so. The primary imagination is thinking God's thoughts after him. The secondary works with that. And it just takes those things and it retells them, it mixes them up, it dissolves them, it diffuses them, it dissipates, and then it brings them back together in a unity. So it takes the universe that God has created and then it recreates it. But that's the original template is that of the primary imagination the way things are. And when I say the way things are, I don't mean in a uh, epistemological sense, I mean, or, or maybe it is, but in the sense of it, it's it, the principle of the thing. 
what is the principle of nature? What's the nature of nature? That's what the primary imagination reveals. A, a deeper sense of the way things relate to one another. And people, everyone has, I think, the power of the primary imagination. Otherwise, they can't think. But the secondary imagination is what the poet has. And note that it's a power related to the primary. It's not something uniquely his own. So when Coleridge he called imaginative, he's going to say that what he had in common with all other poets before him was this thing, the primary, for sure. They all shared this in common, and that's what made it genuinely imaginative. They all had the primary attribute and we're able to reveal it. Now, each did so by using the secondary imagination, but the secondary imagination differed from age to age. But they had all in common this. Otherwise, they weren't imaginative at all. So the secondary imagination can differ and does differ. And we can compare the fruits of Wordsworth's mind, the fruits of Milton's mind, the fruits of Virgil's, and the fruits of Homer's and Shakespeare's and so forth. And they're all imaginative. But note that when we call them imaginative, it's not a quality unique to them, and it can't be compared to others. Here's the ground of comparison, the primary. You may say, what the, what's the difference? We'll maybe come to that in a second. Whereas the f note that he also gives it the predicate of vital. It has life. Whereas the objects just simply taken as objects are fixed and dead. Whereas the fancy has no other counters to play with but fixities and definites. So the fancy deals with dead things. It doesn't have the vibrancy of truth. It's like truths that are held so dearly that they are, lie side by side with the most exploded falsehoods. And they're just dormant. They don't, it doesn't have the efficacy of truth or the power of truth. And he says, fancy is just a mode of memory emancipated from the order of time and space. He gets this directly out of Locke, by the way. It is blended with and modified by the empirical phenomenon of the will, which we express by the word choice. We get this from the law of association, that's it. Uh, it's directly from Locke, the law of association. It's just relating this thing to that thing. But there's no really powerful, potent primary involvement there. So that's his definition. It's two definitions, and the one grounds the other. Now, where do, wherein does he differ from the other romantics? It seems to me the other romantics, including Wordsworth, is claiming of his imagination that it's true of all previous imaginations. We heard him say that, right? And all good poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. All good poetry. And that it more or less reflects a revelation of the nature of things, the natural order, and therefore it's the common language of the people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's getting down to the integrity. Now, I think the men are na aiming after the same thing. Wordsworth is trying to identify how his imagination gets to the roots of things, their primary status, the principle of things. I think that's what he's trying to enunciate. But what he mistakes himself in is thinking that the only way you, ca the only way you can do that is by writing in the language of common men or by dealing with individuals close to the land or by being in the presence of nature. And that that must be true of all good poetry, and it's not so. We have no sense that that's true of Shakespeare. It's not true of Homer. It's not true of Virgil. It's not true of Dante. It's not true of Spencer. Or if aspects of it are true, there are also too many other things that are considerations that would suggest it's an oversimplification. But Wordsworth's trying to get to the principle of things, and the principle of things for Wordsworth is proximity to nature. And it's proximity to nature because then you get to the origins of things. And what's the origin? The origin is nature before it becomes civilized. And for Wordsworth, civilization is the uh, 
a perversion of nature. Remember he talks about being in cities and the din of cities and the noise and the preoccupation with novelty. So he, he's in sync with Coleridge on this. this, this preoccupation with the news. Everything's got to be new. What's new? What's news? And there's this day, there's this, because of the repetition of their lives and the daily monotony, they're, they're endlessly desiring new things to be titillated by the latest news, whatever the news is, however vapid it is. And so he's getting down to the principle of it. But, but Coleridge says that the primary imagination is related to how God has created things. And it's not the poet, the, and the origin isn't nature. Whereas Wordsworth says it's nature, right? We get back to nature. Coleridge says, no, it's not. It's the repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. It's a, more of a, a, a Christian representation of the thing. Is he saying the same thing as Wordsworth? I'm not sure he is. Because I've said uh, in my contention, I don't think it can be uh, controverted is that Wordsworth is a panentheist. He's suggesting that there's a God's presence in the physical things and in the mind of the man and in the living air and the setting of the suns and so forth that this is a spirit and a presence that is in all things and it rolls through all things. That doesn't sound like God, that sounds like spirit and if you don't know the difference Not all spirit is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is a person. Tripersonal, in fact, uh, is the Godhead and the Holy Spirit being one of those persons and not to be conflated in any way, shape, or form with the created order. God is outside creation. He has uncreated being. So God's being is uncreated being. Whereas the cosmos, so everything that's created, is created being, is God's uncreated being like created being insofar as they both have in common ground being? You might say yes because they have the same word. What reason would you have to conclude that the being of God and the being of the created order are the same? Because if you thought that they were, then you could deduce from this everything about God. But then God says that he is not like the gods of this world. And he cannot be represented in forms or in idols. He cannot be represented. And if his being were like that, then it could be in some way. But he's categorically, you must not represent me. There's no, right? Second commandment prohibition against idolatry. You must not create an image of me. Whereas if, if being were contig contiguous here, it was the same thing, then you could do that, but it's not. It's clearly not in scripture. And I th my sense, and I might be wrong on this, but I think that Coleridge has in mind uh, the, in the primary imagination, it's the created order, which is a reflection of the divine maker, but that doesn't mean it's the same thing. But maybe more needs to be said by Coleridge on this. I had an argument with uh, David Jasper on this point as a Coleridge scholar, Christian uh, friend of mine years ago. He thinks that Coleridge is more in the line of the liberal theological school and I, I d don't agree, but maybe he's right. I just don't, I don't think he is, but, but he does. Um, but that sense here that the primary imagination is, is, is created by God and bears the mark of his agency, but at the same time is not to be conflated with his agency. I think there are those distinct, because there are almost two definitions in the primary. Look at it. He says, the living power and prime agent of all human perception and a repetition. Those two things don't fit together for me. He almost seems to be making two statements. I, I, I wonder what he's struggling with here, but it's two things. 
it's the living power and the prime agent of all human perception. Is that a reference to God or to human capacities? If it's human capacities, why is it called an agent? Because an agent is not a capacity. It doesn't say agency, it says agent. It's an actor. And he's the prime agent of all human perception. Well, does that now mean God? I think it might. I, I, I'm leaning that way, and it's a living power, right? So it, it's divine, and yet, alongside that, and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation and the infinite I am. Maybe Coleridge needed to delay a little bit longer and <laughs> before he came to his definition. He hasn't completed it yet here, but it sounds to me uh, like he's saying two things that are quite different under one heading. and struggling to represent these two aspects in this. At any rate, the secondary, which is the poetic imagination, is an echo of this one. And it doesn't do anything new. It just takes what's here, breaks it down, and puts it back together. And the genius, which works with the secondary imagination, brings a, 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 an appearance of novelty, which is not really. But remember, he said the appearance of novelty. So the genius makes this power, which is all po poets' power, appear novel, where, whereas really the novelty is making this vivid. So it's not original, and it's not natural. It doesn't come out of nature. It comes out of the way God created nature. Maybe these distinctions don't matter to you. I think that they, they matter a great deal. Uh, the uh, later rendering of it, which I think is maybe helpful, and it's not Wordsworth's phrase or Coleridge's, it's Tolkien's, it's subcreation. So subcreation being the secondary imagination. So there's creation, and then there's subcreation. And subcreation does effectively what the secondary imagination does. I don't know if you find that helpful or not. But in this, there's a connection uh, in the primary, which is not there in Tolkien, of the imago Dei. There's an agency there. There's something about human nature that's connected in Coleridge's definition. And it's a little less obvious in the term subcreation. <coughs> but I think they're talking about something similar there. So it's a genuinely creative power, but its creativity is delimited by, by God's boundary markers. <coughs> Does that make uh, comments or questions? Or further clarification, or have I gone on long enough about this? Yes, yeah. Brent. Um, there's a, a scholar in Cambr at Cambridge named Douglas Hadley who says that it does. And he refers to the Neoplatonists uh, just prior to this. And um, I think he means something different by it than that. But I do think that it has bear some similarity. So from, from the being of God, there being, uh, in the Neoplatonists, God is presented often as a fountain and being pours down out of him. So being emanates from that. Um, that doesn't seem, so those Neoplatonic presentation seem to me uh, impersonal, whereas this sounds living power and prime agent sounds more personal and less impersonal. And the reference to I am further solidifies that. So I think it, that he approves of Plato, and he, re he clearly does in language, but I think he's deviating it. So he mentions Kant, he mentions the Neoplatonists, and yet this definition seems not to fit with either of them pretty well. Because he also says of Kant, he could not believe that he didn't mean more by his uh, definition of the imagination than he said, because it couldn't possibly just be what, couldn't just be that. So he dis he's dis in disagreement with his forebears, or his contemporaries even. But good, good question. It does sound a bit like that, right? So the primary then would be the form, and the secondary would be the particular relating to the form, right? That, you know, it's plausible. It just seems to have more language that distances it itself from that position. But there's certainly the analogies there. Other comments, questions? Yes. Yes. 
So does the secondary uh, align with the idea of mimesis? I think it does. And the word repetition suggests it. And then the question is, what goes on in mimesis? And how do you distinguish mimesis in the sense of repetition, the sense of just copying? Well, that's what the fancy does as well. It's also just imitating, right? So it's not merely copying, it's, get, it's getting to the principle of that thing in a way that the fancy does not. The fancy is just associating ideas, and there's nothing really poetic about that. It's a fanciful thing, but it's not, a, it's not an imaginative thing, and he wants to reserve for the great poets this imaginative capacity, which is more than associating ideas, which is also mimesis. And mimesis, in the sense here of fancy, is also what Plato disparages. You know, and they're just copying things on the surface, but they don't get down to the real thing. It's like shadows on the wall of the cave. They don't get to the essence of things. So I do think so, but then just begs the question, what do you mean by mimesis? But clearly, whereas Wordsworth, again, go back last time in, the, in the, um, his preface, he said that he didn't uh, want to just simply to imitate and he didn't want to argue somebody into approval of, of things like that. And so he was very wary of mimesis, but he seems to be wary of it in, in, the, in this sense. But he doesn't seem to realize that he needs to be mimetic in this sense. So it's not that maybe the men are in agreement broadly, but they're not, there's not sufficient parsing out of terminology for Coleridge to feel comfortable and think y your theory is seriously problematic. It does not hold up. And so he's going to then enunciate how this is. So let me get to that. Chapter 14. Chapter 14, so it's part two. He talks about the or occasion of the lyrical ballads and the objects originally proposed. And then he writes about the preface to the second edition, the ensuing controversy, its causes and its acrimony, the philosophic definitions of a poem and poetry with scolia. So during the first year of that, of that Mr. Wordsworth and I were neighbors, our conversation turned frequently to the two cardinal points of poetry. One, the power of exciting the sympathy of the reader by a faithful adherence to the truth of nature. How do you get the reader to adhere to the faithful truth of, of nature? This, so it's doing, getting this to adhere to that. They're both talking about that. Two, the power of giving the interest of novelty by the modifying colors of the imagination. So faithful adherence to this, coloring imagination this. So how do we get those two things? Because both are necessary. A sense that you're saying something true and vital and always eternally true. And at the same time, not just saying what somebody else said and quoting their lines. How do you give it the impression of novelty? The sudden charm which accidents of light and shade, which moonlight or sunset diffused over a known and familiar landscape appeared to, the, to represent the practicability of combining both. These are the poetry of nature. And that's Wordsworth's great hallmark, right? The poet of nature. The thought suggested itself, to which of us I do not recollect, that a series of poems might be composed of two sorts. In one, the incidents and agents were to be, at, in part at least, supernatural. And the excellence aimed at was to consist in the interesting of the affections by the dramatic truth of such emotions, as would naturally accompany such situations, supposing them real. And real in this sense they have been to every human being who, from whatever source of delusion, has at any time believed himself under supernatural agency. Now that's going to be what Coleridge does, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, and then also Christabel. Right, he has supernatural characters, demonic possessed or, or possessed by some spirit. That He writes about that. It's scary stuff. And anyone who believes himself under supernatural agency will believe this real. Coleridge believes that this is entirely possible and has experienced it. Whereas the second class, subject, subjects were chosen from ordinary life. The characters and incidents were to be such as will be found in every village and its vicinity where there is a meditative and feeling mind to seek after them or notice them when they present themselves. And they both agreed that this is what they would do. And then they said, Coleridge, you do the supernatural bit and I'll do the natural bit. But both of them together will do what? 
um, Thomas Carlyle calls characteristic of the Romantic period, he calls it natural supernaturalism. The great Victorian writer, Thomas Carlyle. There's a natural supernaturalism, a sense of the supernatural in the natural and a sense of the natural in the supernatural. It fuses those two. Theologically, I've called it panentheism. And there's a part of it which could certainly fit with the grand Christian tradition of relating a sense of God's created order and, and fusing it with color and vibrancy and using what Tolkien calls subcreation. So fictive beings, and yet we can imagine them real. Or Lewis's Narnia. That's entirely possible under that. And in fact, it, it does seem to work that way. Or in Spencer's Fairy Queen. Or in the Knights of the Round Table. Are these real characters or are they fictive beings? Well, even if they're fictive creations, they have a sense of a reality that's rooted in uh, a more true life than one that's actually lived sometimes. Anyway, so he, they agree on this and they are presented as an experiment. And he said to the second ed edition, he added a preface of considerable length in which notwithstanding some passages of apparently a contrary import, he was understood to contend for the extension of this style to poetry of all kinds and to reject as vicious and indefensible all phrases and forms of style that were not included in what he, unfortunately, I think, adopting an equivocal expression, called the language of real life. From this preface, prefix to poems in which it was impossible to deny the presence of original genius, however mistaken its direction might be deemed, arose the long-continued controversy. For from the conjunction of perceived power with supposed heresy, I explain the inveteracy and in some instances, I grieve to say, the acrimonious passions with which the controversy has been conducted by the assailants. Just what I said at the outset. Controversy arises. There's no denying of Wordsworth's genius. There's also the appearance of heresy, and he's being charged with it. Wordsworth is, and so is Coleridge. Coleridge wants to argue that if it is true, and he thinks that there is truth and genius in Wordsworth's uh, presentation, then it can be defended in a way on terms other than the ones that Wordsworth has used. But he is going to agree with the critics that if Wordsworth is saying what he appears to be saying, he's throwing the whole poetic tradition under the bus, first of all, if they don't write the way he does. And Coleridge is not going to agree that uh, foregoing writers lacked poetic power if they didn't write like Wordsworth. What a bunch of garbage and nonsense that is. And also that um, you can defend his position and still hold on to a Christian perspective and he is then going to articulate it. But Wordsworth has not done so. And in fact, his defense has given uh, fuel to the fire on which he's going to be burnt. <laughs> not literally, but figuratively. And so he says that, and he says that it, really interestingly. Had Wordsworth's poems been the silly, the childish things which they were for a long time described as being, had they really been distinguished from the compositions of other poets merely by the meanness of language and inanity of thought, had they indeed contained nothing more than what is found in the parodies and pretended imitations of them, they must have sunk at once a dead weight uh, into the slough of oblivion and have dragged the preface along with them. But year after year increased the number of Mr. Wordsworth's admirers. They were found, too, not in the lower classes of the reading public, but chiefly among young men of strong sensibility and meditative minds. And their admiration, inflamed perhaps in some degree by opposition, was distinguished by its intensity, I might almost say, by its religious fervor. Now, that's interesting. And if you want to read books on that, they talk about the influence of Wordsworth and Coleridge in the Victorian church and a sort of a revival because Wordsworth and Coleridge are defending a supernatural, a non-rationalist, non-empiricist sense 
of reality in the world that's, that is re recapturing something that the Enlightenment lost, namely the sense that the cosmos is uh, sacred in some way. Not literally sacred, but in the sense that there's a, a, an order that's, that's good and true and beautiful. The disenchantment, which I think began centuries before, uh, and I don't know what the dividing line for it would be, but it could be the, the, the new cosmology. When the old Ptolemaic cosmology was thrown out and the new one brought in, maybe that was the mark, the disenchantment of the mind from the universe. So the sense that everything is an expression of the goodness of God. The whole creation speaks to his glory. It says so in scripture. It says so in the poetry, actually, up until the coming scientific age and then suddenly everything seems to be instrumental in its causes and no longer there's no sense of um, the uh, creator and the, the telos of creation. Everything is screaming out the glory of God, declaring all over the place. But that sense, and he had captured that, the, that, that life is a, um, is a pageantry of sorts and it has meaning. It's not just atoms colliding. Uh, so there was a great hope laid in this. But he says, with many parts of this preface, in the sense attributed to them and which the words undoubtedly seem to authorize, I never concurred. That's a pretty clear statement. So many parts, others accused it, but even his own words seem to authorize, I never concurred but on the contrary objected to them as erroneous in principle and as contradictory, in appearance at least, both to other parts of the same preface and to the author's own practice in the greater number of poems themselves. I mean, what could be a worse indictment? So I didn't agree with any of it. He contradicts himself all over the place. It doesn't even, it's not even, so his definition of poetry isn't even true of his own poetry, let alone anyone else's. And Mr. Wordsworth in his recent collection, as I found, degraded this prefatory disquisition to the end of his second volume to be read or not at the reader's choice. But he has not, as far as I can discover, announced any change in his poetic creed. And Coleridge wants him to recant. <laughs> Revolco, take back this, this wretched preface. This is not right. And he won't do it. And then he goes on to say what he ought to do. And now here's what he's doing. The office of philosophical disquisition consists in just distinction. That's proper distinctions, just distinction. While it is the privilege of the philosopher to preserve himself constantly aware that distinction is not division, in order to obtain adequate notions of any truth, he must intellectually separate its distinguishable parts. And this is the technical process of philosophy. This is not that. So we must separate things. These things are not the same thing. This is, these are distinct things. But having done so, we must then restore them in our conceptions to the unity in which they actually coexist. And this is the result of philosophy. And then you'll talk about what a poem is after this and so forth. And I'll skip over that. But the result of all this is pleasure. Pleasure and that of the highest and most permanent kind may result from the attainment of the end, but it is not itself the immediate end. Pleasure is not the immediate end of science. It's talking about here. But pleasure is the immediate outcome of poetry. So it's not just truth, it's pleasure. Pleasure is the immediate outcome of poetry, and it's the immediate end. Go back, and he's commenting now, if you want, and go and compare what he says here in chapter 14, and go back to what Augustine says about teaching and delighting, and even what um, Horace says, right? That you're, you're to teach, and you're to delight, and, and uh, Sir Philip Sidney agreed as well, right? You're, it's teaching and delighting. And delighting is the unique feature of poetry, because other disciplines also teach. So what's unique about poetry is the aim of delight. But it can't, it, it doesn't, it's not delighting without the teaching. But the unique bit is the delight. 
So it is true of poetry. Now I'm going to skip on to a few other parts here to where he tears apart Wordsworth's uh, definition. He just sketched out that he says it was erroneous in principle and contradictory all over the place. Let me come to some of these parts. He says, this is from chapter 17. The poet informs his reader that he had generally chosen low and rustic life but not as low and rustic, or in order to repeat the pleasure of doubtful moral effect, which persons of elevated rank and of superior refinement oftentimes derive from a happy imitation of the rude, unpolished manners and discourse of their inferiors. For the pleasure so derived may be traced to three exciting causes. No, I'm gonna skip all over that. No, 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 it's, it's, it's too... Uh, too long and too, um, I get too deep in the weeds there. Um, further on in 17. Let's talk about the best part of language, because remember he said that the best part of language uh, comes from those from rural occupations and people who are daily communing in the presence of nature. And that's the best part of human language. That's what he says. So uh, let me occupy myself with that here. So he says, as little can I agree with the assertion that from the objects which the rustic hourly communicates, the best part of language is formed. For first, if to communicate with an object implies such an acquaintance with it as renders it capable of being discriminately reflected on, the distinct knowledge of an uneducated rustic would furnish a very scanty vocabulary. Just because you're out on the farm doesn't mean that you come up with, you're thinking a lot about what you're doing and you come up with a terrific wide variety of terms to describe it and think about what's actually going on there. And he said, the few things and modes of action requisite for his bodily convenience would alone be individualized, while all the rest of nature would be expressed by a small number of confused general terms. Secondly, I deny, deny that the words and combinations of words derived from the objects with which the rustic is familiar whether with distinct or confused knowledge, can be justly said to form the best part of language. It is more than probable, now this is interesting, that the many classes of the brute creation possess discriminating sounds, by which they can convey to each other notices of such objects as concern their food, shelter, or safety. So when birds make a noise or insects or whatever, they no doubt can make noises that make those distinction, distinctions. Yet we hesitate to call the aggregate of such sounds a language. So he's not only going after Wordsworth here, he's going after Rousseau and Herder and the origins of language. This is not language. These are noises. They have signs. But do the signs have the characteristic of language that roots it back to things? I don't think so. Cheep, cheep, cheep there's a female bird or whatever, or there's food or whatever the noise is, and they're making the distinction there. But are they actually referring to things like a language will do, or are they simply signifying in a way that will point to something there, but never a thing? We hesitate to call these a language otherwise than, other than metaphorically. Whereas the best part of human language, properly so-called, is derived from reflection on the acts of the mind itself. Now this seems to go back to this. The best part. On the acts of the mind itself, it is formed by a voluntary, so it has to have a will and a free will at that. A voluntary reflection, or rather appropriation of fixed symbols to internal acts, to processes and results of imagination the greater part of which have no place in the consciousness, consciousness of uneducated man. Though in civilized society by imitation and passive remembrance of what they hear from their religious instructors and other superiors, the most uneducated share in the harvest which they neither sowed or reaped. So people can get all sorts of terms that they did nothing to uh, think about, they just simply learn the language. And with that, they have, they have trophies of hard intellectual labor that they've gained from other people. And these, these are, this is a term, it means something. Theological terms like justification, 
or theosis, I mean, whatever, very abstract conceptually. You can use the word, and with the word, there's a lot of thought that has come into that term, which is going to do certain work. It's a tool. It's a tool that somebody else has forged. You're just using the tool. And he, he will say that they have had these given to them, the common people in England, for example, in Wordsworth's Northwest in the Lake District. And he said, if the history of the phrases in hourly currency among our peasants were traced, a person not previously aware of the fact would be surprised at finding so large a number, which three or four centuries ago were the exclusive property of the universities and schools. And at the commencement of the Reformation had been transferred from the school to the pulpit and thus gradually passed into the common life. So how did Wordsworth peasants come across these capacities and these words? It came from the universities through the pulpits into the common vocabulary. So now they can see distinctions and they can act in accordance with it. So it's a, it reflects this once again. Right? This is repeating God's thoughts after them and it's been trickled down. That doesn't give them, the, them secondary imagination, but they are using the primary imagination there. The ext and now here's another example. It's a counter example. So three or four centuries ago, the common people would have had no such thing, and now they do because of the Reformation. It's been passed into the common people's vocabulary, but now the extreme difficulty and often the impossibility of finding words for the simplest moral and intellectual processes in the language of uncivilized tribes has proved perhaps the weightiest obstacle to the progress of our most zealous and adroit missionaries. This is the time of the worldwide missionary movement. And they struggle and our linguistics faculty will talk, what is the corresponding term in this language that fits with that? They don't have a term, it doesn't exist. So what do you do when you, it's a vital term to understand the Christian faith and it doesn't exist in the vocabulary of the, the tribe to which you're trying to bring a biblical translation. This is your challenge. And he says, yet those tribes are surrounded by the same nature as our peasants are. <laughs> so if it were just from nature, they would have them because in still more impressive forms, and they are moreover obliged to particularize many more of them because of course their natural world is far, far more vibrant. So if you go into the South Pacific and the, the, the rainforest and so forth, the terrific diversity of life, why don't they have the terrific diversity of vocabulary that goes with it and concepts? If you follow Wordsworth's theory, he's not diminishing the tribes, by the way. He's saying his theory is rubbish. Can't be true. It's not just natural. It doesn't come from nature, in fact. It's a reflection on the mind of God. And it passed from the universities through the pulpit into the common vocabulary, but not, don't mistake it for being a result of being in the presence of nature. That's not where it came from. It's, it's simply not true. Because if it were, these things would not be true. And he says that when therefore, Mr. Wordsworth says, accordingly such a language, meaning as before the language of rustic life, purified from, from provincialism, arising out of repeated experience and regular feelings is a more permanent and a far more philosophical language than that which is frequently substituted for it by poets. It may be answered that the language which he has in view can be attributed to rustics with no greater right than the style of Richard Hooker or Francis Bacon to Tom Brown or Sir Roger Lestrange. Doubtless, if what is peculiar to each were omitted in each, the result would needs be the same. Further, that the poet who uses an illogical diction or a style fitted to excite only the low and changeable pleasure of wonder substitutes a language of folly and vanity, not for that of the rustic, but for that of good sense and natural feeling. Anyway. And then he goes after the word real and he rips them apart. So I, I don't want to go on at great length to that, but um, I want to move on to his final point here, uh, at least the, and then he talks about the genuine brilliance of Wordsworth in chapter 18, by the way, and he lists them and there's about six points, I think. Five, five points. But he says that, and then he goes through the defects in chapter 22, and these are quite brilliant. But here's the final point. 
and it's really just thrown in there in the midst of 22. And uh, I think there's something here. And he says, how is it probable that, uh, no, I'll start here. The feelings with which, as Christians, we contemplate a mixed congregation rising or kneeling before their common maker. So when you're in a church and you see people from all classes of life and all stations and they're united in a body here. So that feeling that we have, Mr. Wordsworth would have us entertain at all times as men and as readers. And by the excitement of this lofty yet prideless impartiality in poetry, he might hope to have encouraged its continuance in real life. The praise of good men be his. In real life, and I trust even in my imagination, I, I honor a virtuous and wise man without reference to the presence or absence of artificial advantages. So it doesn't matter if he is where he's from, who he is, if he's a wise man, let's honor him by all means. Forget about the station uh, or the uh, social advantages. Whether in the person of an armed baron, a laureled bard, etc., or an old peddler, or still older leech gatherer, the same qualities of head and heart must claim the same reverence. So he agrees with that. What is wise in a nobody is the same as the wisdom in somebody who is the, in the loftiest uh, pulpit in the land or in the University of Oxford or Cambridge or whatever. So that's, and it ought to be honored as such, and he agrees with that. And even if poetry, I am not conscious that I've ever suffered my feelings to be disturbed or offended by any thoughts or images which the poet himself has not presented. But yet I object nevertheless and for the following reasons. First, because the object in view as an immediate object belongs to the moral philosopher and would be pursued not only more appropriately, but in my opinion with far greater probability of success in sermons or moral essays than in an elevated poem. It seems indeed to destroy the main fundamental distinction, not only between a poem and prose, but even between philosophy and works of fiction, inasmuch as it proposes truth for its immediate object, whereas the immediate object of poetry is pleasure, not truth, not the immediate. So he's trying to do too much with poetry. He's making it into a theology. It's not capable of it. It's like what Doc, Richard Dawkins does with science. He's trying to make grand theological, philosophical claims. It's embarrassing. It's the equivalent. Wordsworth is trying to do too much with his poetry. He's trying to make theological, philosophical claims. He should stop it. Poets should please. Now, the blessed, now till the blessed time shall come when truth itself shall be pleasure and both shall be so united as to be distinguishable in words only, not in feeling it will remain the poet's office to proceed upon the state of association which actually exists as general instead of attempting first to make it what it ought to be. So he's anticipating heaven. He's trying to make a world in which God's presence is everywhere at all times without any diminishment. That is not the world in which we live. So it's, 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 it's trying, in a sense, to see the eschaton in the world right now. It's a theologized world and all, by all means, but that's not the world. So he calls it, it is a small hysteron proteron. So he brings the later first. It's what will be one day when God in the new creation. That's the word the word, the world that Wordsworth describes, it will be true of that world. It's not true of our world. And the communication of pleasure is the introductory means by which alone the poet may expect to moralize his poetry. And second, this argument to be groundless, etc., etc. But I'll conclude with that. But uh, you can see where he is getting not just to the uh, argument, but even the effect of it in the theological, supernatural sense. And, and he is troubled on multiple levels with it. But we will come back to Mr. Coleridge and this desynonymization of the imagination and, and rooting it, because I think there's, there's uh, fruit to build on here uh, when discussing other poetry. I think he does actually do some genuinely good things here. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Uh, next time.